Need some spice in your DIY modular? Here's a simple sample and hold circuit that can add some chaotic randomness to your patches. Even though the name might sound somewhat intimidating, designing a sample and hold circuit is actually quite straightforward and simple. Before we can start with that though, we'll have to make sure we understand what it does exactly. Thankfully, the name is actually quite helpful here. At its core, a sample and hold circuit does two things, sampling and holding a voltage. For that, it has two inputs, one that gets the 2B sampled voltage and another that gets a trigger signal initiating the sampling process. At the output, the circuit should then provide a copy of the sampled voltage until the next trigger comes in, that is, holding it. If that description is too abstract for your taste, let's look at this with an example. We'll assume we have two input signals. The first is a slow triangle oscillation, which will feed into the circuit's sampling input. The second is a significantly faster square wave oscillation, which will plug into the circuit's trigger input. The output then looks like a repeating set of stairs going up and down. So instead of the continuous slope of the triangle input wave, we get a kind of digital approximation. If you do this with white noise instead of an LFO, you will get weird random voltages at the output, like we heard in the intro, where I used this to control my VCO with it. And while implementing this might seem like a tough job, at its core, the mechanics of a sample and hold circuit are dead simple. We only need two elements, some sort of switch and a capacitor. To start out simple, I went with the most naive implementation here, using an actual manual momentary switch. Here's how it works. We apply our 2B sampled voltage to the switch while connecting the other end to the capacitor. Before we push down the button, the capacitor will be empty, so the voltage here is going to be zero volts. As soon as we push the button, a current will flow through the switch and into the capacitor, charging it up. The same goes in reverse for a negative input voltage. Once the voltages on both sides are equal, the current flow will stop. We've sampled the input voltage. If we now release the button, the voltage over here will stay exactly the same, no matter what happens on this side since we've cut the connection, meaning that we're holding the sampled voltage. Only trouble is that we're not interested in manual control here. Instead, we want to trigger the sampling phase electrically. So we'll have to exchange the push button for a different type of component. If you're now already thinking about transistors, then you're on the right track. Transistors, as we know, are often used as electrically controlled switches. On this channel, we've exclusively focused on a specific type of transistor so far, the BJT, or Bipolar Junction Transistor. Unfortunately, that type of transistor isn't ideal for our purposes here, for a whole bunch of intertwined reasons. I don't want to go into too much detail, so we'll heavily simplify the issue. Let's assume we directly replace our momentary switch with a BJT. As we know, the transistor will allow for current to flow between its collector and emitter if we apply a voltage to the base. You might then think that applying a voltage to the base is the same as pushing the button on our momentary switch, 
Only trouble with that is that it's totally not true. A closed switch behaves exactly like a piece of conductive wire. An active BJT does not. The closed switch will allow for current to freely flow in both directions, depending only on the voltage applied across it. The BJT, on the other hand, is much more complicated in this regard. The amount of current allowed to flow between collector and emitter is fixed, and depends on a multitude of factors. The amount of current flowing into the base, the overall direction of flow, the transistor-specific gain level, and so on. Worse yet, if there's not enough current flowing on the main path, the transistor will allow for large currents to flow into the base and kind of fill the gap. So where pushing the momentary switch reliably and instantaneously charges or discharges our capacitor to the input voltage level, the BJT will behave much more inconsistently. As a result, the held output voltage will rarely be the same as the supposedly sampled input voltage. That's not to say that it doesn't work at all. It would just be a fairly sloppy implementation. I've put an example circuit in the description that you can check out if you're curious about this. Thankfully, there's a different type of transistor that is better suited to our use case. The Junction Field Effect Transistor, or JFET for short. There's two variants of these, called the N-channel and the P-channel JFET, which can be either symmetrical or asymmetrical. To keep things manageable, we'll focus on just one of these, the symmetrical N-channel version. So whenever I say JFET from now on, I'll be talking about this type. The main difference between such a JFET and our trusty BJT is that the JFET, while active, behaves somewhat like a weak resistor, meaning that it allows for current to flow through it depending on the voltage applied across it, no matter the direction. There are a few caveats here though, which we'll talk about in a minute. Before that, let's first clear up the basics. Like the BJT, a JFET has three terminals. The naming convention is different though. Instead of collector, base and emitter, a JFET has a drain, a gate and a source terminal. The flow of current between drain and source is controlled by a voltage applied to the gate. Since voltages are always just relative though, we'll have to ask what the point of reference for that gate voltage actually is. The short answer to this is simple. The point of reference is the source terminal. So when we're talking about the gate voltage, we're talking about the voltage between gate and source. The long answer is a tiny bit trickier though. As I said earlier, the direction of flow between drain and source can be reversed freely. And if we think of the source as the terminal that current is flowing out of, then source and drain basically switch positions once we do reverse the current flow. So effectively, the gate voltage is always measured in relation to the terminal that current is flowing out of. And that will always be the one where the applied voltage is lower. With that in mind, here's how the gate voltage relates to the drain to source current. For this, we're assuming that the drain and source voltages are fixed at 1 and 0 volts respectively. Now generally, the JFET is considered to be fully active when there's no voltage between gate and source, meaning that they're both sitting at ground level in this example. Here, the transistor will basically act like a very weak resistor, and so Ohm's law applies, which tells us that the amount of current flowing is determined by the voltage between drain and source fighting the JFET's resistance. If we push the gate voltage up from there, we can increase the drain to source current further. This happens because we are effectively further decreasing the JFET's resistance. But beware, if you push it up too much, a large current will begin flowing into the gate, potentially destroying the component. Now, if we lower the gate voltage from here, which means pulling it below the source, we can reduce the amount of drain to source current. This happens because we're increasing the JFET's resistance. And as we know, a steady voltage faced with an increasing resistance results in a decreasing current. Once we're exceeding a voltage difference of more than 4 volts, the JFET turns off completely and prevents any current from flowing. So in short, via the gate to source voltage, we can vary the resistance between drain and source from very weak to almost infinite. 
Now you might have noticed that the drain to source voltage in our example was suspiciously low. I did that because the resistor comparison only really holds up for relatively small drain to source voltages. To show you what happens with bigger voltages, I've drawn up this second graph. Here we can see the relation between drain to source voltage and drain to source current if the gate to source voltage stays at zero volts constantly. So, source and gate are fixed at zero volts while we push up the drain voltage. Interestingly and annoyingly, the JFET stops behaving like a resistor after we increase that drain voltage beyond approximately three volts. Because with a resistor, the current would simply keep increasing in a straight line. With our JFET, we run into a hard upper threshold. Note that this threshold, along with the general relation between gate voltage and drain current, can vary quite heavily depending on the JFET model you're looking at. The values I'm using here are just a kind of rough average. Now for our use case, the fact that the drain current is capped is not ideal, but it's also not the end of the world. All it means is that the bigger the drain to source voltage is, the slower our capacitor will be charged up. Think of it like this. To get the voltage at this point up to, say, 5 volts, a specific amount of current has to flow into the capacitor. With our switch, this happens almost instantaneously, since there is barely any resistance here and certainly no speed limit. With our JFET, it will take a short while though, precisely because it has a speed limit. Now if we double the input voltage to 10 volts, twice the amount of current has to flow into the capacitor. With our switch, again, that will happen almost instantaneously. With our JFET though, it will take nearly twice as long, since the charging speed stays mostly constant. Why is this a problem? Well, it has to do with the accuracy of the sampling process. Imagine we're trying to sample a white noise signal. In such a signal, the voltage is jumping around wildly and randomly. With our momentary switch, the voltage we sample will always be accurate and true to the input. Because while we press down on the button, the capacitor voltage will precisely follow that input voltage, as the charging process is instantaneous. And once we let go, we hold it exactly at the then current value. With our JFET, things work a bit differently. First, instead of pushing and releasing a button, we'll have to bring the gate up to the source voltage and then pull it down to a really negative value to make sure it's always at least four volts below the source. Second, while we do that, the capacitor voltage will be lagging behind the input voltage during big jumps because of the JFET's maximum current cap. Here's how that would work out in detail. If we activate the JFET at this point and then deactivate it over here, the capacitor voltage won't be equal to the then current input voltage, simply because there wasn't enough time to get it charged up to that value. Instead, we'll be getting an output that is somewhat lower. What can we do about this? Well, there's at least two things that we might consider. First, we could reduce the volume of our input voltage. Because as we said earlier, the JFET speed limit only kicks in if the drain to source voltage is more than about 3 volts. So if we'd scale our input down to 3 volts peak to peak, then we could charge and discharge our capacitor without that speed limit, which should increase our sampling accuracy quite a bit. The only pain point is that we'd have to also amplify the output signal to get it back up to the original input signal's volume. The second option is a lot simpler, but it comes with a trade-off. We can use a very small capacitor. This helps because a smaller capacitor is charged or discharged more quickly, meaning that we'll have to funnel a smaller amount of current through our JFET to get the voltage here up to the input level. This will make the speed limit less of a deciding factor here, which in turn increases our sampling accuracy. The downside of using a very small capacitor stems from the fact that every capacitor leaks. This means that even when there's seemingly no way for the charge to leave the cap, it will do so anyways. To try and avoid this, we can use capacitor types that are described as being low leakage, but those will still leak. We're dealing with real things here after all, and real things are never ideal.
Even our JFET will let a tiny amount of current through when it's supposedly closed. Now, why is this a problem? Simple. Because as our capacitor loses its charge, the voltage at this point will change. This is sometimes called droop, and it means that our output is not going to be steady during the hold phase. Now, as I said before, we're going to have this problem with every capacitor. So why is it worse of a problem with very small ones? Well, since small capacitors hold less charge, the same amount of leakage will affect their voltage level much more severely. Bigger capacitors leak the same way, but proportionally to their capacitance, they lose less charge per second and thereby hold their voltage steady for longer. As you can see, there's quite the dilemma here. Because if we want to increase the sampling accuracy, we have to decrease the capacitor size. But if we decrease the capacitor size, we'll get a more pronounced droop in the hold phase. Now, after talking so much about accuracy, it might somewhat anger you to hear that in a sample and hold circuit meant for use in a synthesizer, accuracy is really not all that important. At least not important enough to risk noticeable droop. Because if you're simply trying to sample some white noise to get a random sequence of voltages, like I did in the intro, it really doesn't matter if the circuit is tens or even hundreds of millivolts off. It will still sound just as random. This is not to say that high accuracy is never necessary. If you'd want to sample a tuned sequence for your VCO, for example, you'd absolutely need precision. Otherwise, it would sound way out of tune. But that's a very specific and frankly not that practical use case. At least from my perspective. With all this in mind, here's how I decided to set the core circuit up. For now, the input signal is going straight into the JFET. On the other side, I've settled on a 100 nanofarads capacitor. This is big enough to avoid obvious droop, but also small enough to have at least some degree of accuracy. After the capacitor, I've placed a simple op-amp buffer. This is necessary because we need to isolate the capacitor as much as possible to keep the charge within it steady. With a buffer, we can provide a copy of the voltage level at this point to be used by other modules, without pulling current from the capacitor. So far, so simple. But what's up with the resistor and diode at the JFET's gate? Well, as we know, we need to bring the gate up to the source voltage when we want the JFET to conduct, and then pull it down when we want it to block. The problem with that is that depending on which way the current is flowing, source and drain are switching positions. We've discussed this before. By definition, the source terminal is the terminal that current is flowing out of. So whenever the input voltage is higher than the voltage at the capacitor, this terminal will be the source. But once the situation reverses, this terminal becomes the source. So strictly speaking, we would need to always monitor these two voltage levels and then apply whichever is lower to the gate. And although this is doable, there is a way simpler, although dirtier solution. Connecting the input to the gate via a very strong resistor. Here's how that works. Whenever the input is lower than the capacitor voltage, everything is fine anyways. Gate and source voltage are identical. But if the input is higher than the capacitor voltage, we'll run into trouble, right? Because now the gate might sit significantly above the source. And in that situation, as we discussed earlier, we'll get large currents flowing into the gate and potentially destroying the transistor. That would be true if it weren't for this huge 1 mega ohm resistor here, severely limiting the current. Because of this, we'll never see more than a few microamps going into the gate which it can handle easily. Better yet, those few microamps flowing into the gate will make the voltage here drop to a value just slightly above the source voltage. Why is that? Because essentially, the JFET's gate to source path is a simple diode. So as long as the voltage here is zero or below, that diode is blocking. But as soon as we go positive, it will start to conduct and that conductivity ramps up exponentially as the voltage increases linearly. So simplified, the more we push from here, the quicker and wider the diode will open up, sinking most of the current we manage to squeeze through that ginormous resistor. 
It's like as if there's a weird little trapdoor here that opens further the more you push against it. Because of this, no substantial voltage can build up above the one at the source. We'll get a couple hundred millivolts, yes, but that's about it. So with this setup, the gate voltage will always be at or close to the source voltage. As long as this diode doesn't conduct. Why is it here then? Simple, to activate and deactivate the JFET. This is how it works. Whenever we want to start the sampling process, we push the voltage here up to the highest level we have. That's 12 volts in my case. Then this diode will block, because we're pushing the trap door shut from below, leaving the gate voltage at or near the source and thereby activating the JFET. Once we want to enter the hold phase, we'll simply pull this voltage to the lowest level in our system, minus 12 volts in my case. This way, we sync all of the current coming through the resistor and we drag the voltage close to those minus 12 volts, shutting the JFET off in the process. To test this, I'll first set up a TL074, which is four op amps in one chip. This might seem like overkill, but we'll need the additional resources in a minute. Next, I'll bring in the JFET. Any symmetrical N-channel variant will do fine here, I'm using the J113, which should be quite easy to get. Then I'll connect an input socket to the JFET's drain, while also linking drain and gate through a 1 mega ohm resistor. Add in a diode pointing away from the gate, a 100 nanofarads capacitor at the source, connect the source to one of the TL074's op amps, configure that as a buffer, and we're done. To see if everything works as expected, I will first send in a slow triangle oscillation as our 2B sampled signal. Next, I'll hook up a jumper to the diode. This way, I can easily trigger the sample and hold phases by plugging this into the positive or negative rail. To be able to see what's going on, I've hooked my oscilloscope up to the buffer's output. Currently, the circuit is in the hold phase, which is why we're not seeing any signal, the JFET is completely closed. Here's what happens if I connect our diode to the positive rail. The circuit is entering the sampling phase, meaning that the voltage at the capacitor, which we're seeing here, starts to follow the input signal. Now, if I plug our cable into the negative rail, the JFET shuts off and the circuit enters the hold phase, meaning that the output stays fixed to whatever voltage was present at the input when I made the switch. Now, you might ask why we've talked so much about accuracy before, when the waveform we're seeing here seems perfectly undistorted. I'm sending in an about 5 volts peak-to-peak -peak triangle, and our capacitor voltage seems to reproduce that adequately. That might be true, but watch what happens as I decrease the oscillation frequency. My LFO unfortunately doesn't go up that far, but you should still be able to spot the problem. The signal's volume is increasing as the wave cycle gets longer. This is where the JFET speed limit takes its toll. As we push up the frequency, we're charging and discharging our capacitor faster and faster. But because the maximum amount of current that can flow through the JFET is capped, we're neither able to completely fill nor drain it. And this only gets worse as the oscillation's frequency increases but it's a flaw that I think we can live with. What we really can't live with is the fact that currently we're still operating the circuit manually. So let's change that. Now you might be tempted to just use a regular square wave LFO here that you connect to this diode. The first problem with that is that it's probably not loud enough. Because remember, for the sampling phase, we need to push this diode shut with enough force. And for the hold phase, we need to pull the voltage here down as much as possible. So what we'll have to do is take our square wave signal and blow it up as much as we can. For that, we'll use a simple op-amp based comparator. A comparator does just what its name implies. It compares an input voltage to a threshold voltage. Whenever the input is above the threshold, it'll raise its output to the positive supply voltage. And vice versa. Okay, but what threshold voltage should we choose here? Why not simply go with zero volts, ground? Easy, because we don't want our comparator to fire randomly if we leave this input unconnected. 
which can happen if electromagnetic interferences push the voltage here slightly above the zero volts line. By using a voltage divider to set up a 3 volts threshold, we can make our circuit interference proof, with the only downside being that our input square wave has to be at least around 6 volts peak to peak to trigger it. So let's set up our comparator. Thankfully, we've got plenty of op amps left in our TL074. We get our threshold voltage with a 100k, 33k resistor combination, going from the positive rail to ground. Next, connect the non-inverting input to a jack socket and the comparator's output to our diode. Plug in a square wave oscillation as our trigger signal and we should see some action on the oscilloscope. And yeah, something is happening, though this is not exactly what we had in mind. Instead of nice distinct steps, we're getting these weird partly angled monstrosities. What's up with that? Well, the problem is simple. Since we're using a square wave oscillation as our triggering signal, the sampling phase is exactly as long as the hold phase. And as we know, during the sampling phase, the output voltage will follow the input voltage. That's why we get these angled parts in our output. It's just the input triangle pushing through during the sampling phases. What can we do about this? You guessed it, severely shorten the sampling phase because the shorter it is, the less of our input signal will show up in the output. To do that, we just need a simple high-pass filter, which is really only a capacitor followed by a resistor to ground. This will convert our square wave into two voltage spikes, one positive and one negative. To make those spikes really short and snappy, I'm using a super small one nanofarads capacitor and a big 100k resistor. Next, we need to get rid of the negative spike, simply because most op amps will glitch out if you feed them a voltage that is too close to the negative rail. For this, we'll use another diode, followed by a 100k resistor to ground. This way, only the positive spike can pass through, and we're holding the voltage at ground level while the diode is blocking. Our comparator should then spit out a super quick pulse every time our square wave goes high. To try this out, I'll first send our trigger through a 1 nanofarads capacitor, followed by a 100k resistor to ground. From here, we'll take the signal to our comparator through a diode, connect the input to ground through a 100k resistor, and we're done. Let's check the result on the oscilloscope. And yeah, this is looking much better. We get some very sharply defined stairs here. We can change the resolution by changing the trigger frequency. Faster frequency equals more stairs. Slower frequency gives us less stairs. Cool. So next, I'll use this signal to control my VCO. And here's what it looks and sounds like with a white noise source as our input signal. Great, but while our circuit is perfectly usable as it is, we should round it out with a few minor additions. First, we'll buffer our signal input with another op amp. This is just good practice. An input should draw as little current as possible to avoid loading effects. Next, we'll put a potentiometer set up as a variable voltage divider between that buffer and our signal input. This way, we can change the input volume on the fly which might be helpful if we want to reduce the voltage range at the output. Finally, we'll put a 1K resistor between our output buffer and the output socket. This is simply to protect our op amp from short circuits. So I'll set up a 100K potentiometer over here. Connect it to the signal input and to ground. Hook the middle connector up to another op amp, which I'll again configure as a buffer. Send that buffer's output into our JFET, 
put a 1K resistor between output buffer and output socket, and we're ready to give this a final spin. As you can see and hear, I'm still sampling the same white noise source. But watch what happens as I play with the input volume knob. This is super useful if you want your random sequences to stay within a certain range of frequencies. And with that, our circuit is done. In a future video, we'll talk about a few small tweaks and additions that will make it even more useful. But for now, this is all I have. In the meantime, consider supporting me on Patreon. You can get access to a bunch of bonus content there, like a livestream replay archive, a private Discord community, and high-resolution scans of my sketches. Anyways, until next time, see ya!